Hi everyone, my name is Zach. I'm a physical geographer, geomorphologist, and educator. Welcome to Bite Size Geomorphology, a series of short lectures designed to teach introductory topics in the field of geomorphology and physical geography. In this short lecture, we're going to be talking about river gradient and longitudinal profiles, and what they tell us about the dominant processes along a river. So let's dive in. So what is the long profile? Well, the long profile refers to the two-dimensional profile of a river from its headwaters to its mouth, whether that be another river, a lake or a basin, or an ocean. The line of the profile represents the elevation of the surface of the water against the distance upstream from the mouth. We typically think of streams in a constant state of adjustment, working towards a graded or equilibrium state, where there are balances between energy and transport. In this example profile of an alluvial river, we can see that the long, long profile is ideally represented by a concave up shape. However, natural systems are rarely ideal. Here we can see a long profile of the Root River in southeastern Minnesota in the United States. We can see a few things. First, we see multiple lines rather than a single one as in the example. These other lines represent tributary streams that flow into the Root River. They all have their own unique longitudinal profiles that don't necessarily reflect the main stem. On the south branch, circled here, we see a dam that is changing the long profile of the river. We see it kind of acting as a nick point, as we call, or sharp point in the profile. Now, if we look a little bit further downstream, here at Money Creek, we can see that it's significantly steeper than the rest of the tributaries in the figure. Now, we don't know necessarily just off looking at the picture what is driving that, but there are many constraints, whether that be geologic, tectonic, climate-based, or human-based, that control the longitudinal profile of the river. In the case of the Minnesota River, as we can see on the right, uh, there are actually any number of those things, uh, maybe save tectonics, driving this system. So we see Redwood Falls, which is a natural bedrock outcrop that's causing a little bit of a steeper reach. We see Minnesota da or Falls Dam and Granite Falls Dam. Those are human uh, impoundments. And then down near Mankato and Shakopee, there are channelized reaches of the flow. So let's look at some general trends that we can assume with most alluvial rivers and ideal systems. And we're gonna look at a few different factors and discuss how they change throughout the river from the headwaters first down to the mouth, including slope, dominant method of transport, domi dominant activity in each reach, the typical bed materials, and finally how each of these reaches looks in a cross-sectional view and in some imagery. So we'll start with the slope. First trend we see is that slope will tend to decrease in the downstream direction. In this idealized long profile, inspired and modified from a wonderful introductory textbook called Geomorphology by Anderson and Anderson, we see three distinct breaks in slope at 2%, 0.1%, and 0.001% slopes which they link to the transition zones between major grain sizes, which we'll get into a little bit later. But quite simply, the headwater regions represent the section of a stream that is actively expanding the reach of the river, and as a result, many of these streams are much steeper. By the time we get to the mouth, these streams are much larger and are, overwhelming, or are overwhelmed by sediment, resulting in a much lower gradient. This transitions into our understanding of the dominant activity in each of these reaches. In the steeper headwater regions, erosion is the dominant form of activity within the stream. Abrasion of the bed, saltating grains, uh, results in a primarily erosive system. Moving downstream, we move into a zone where erosion lessens and transport begins to pick up, with the river beginning to migrate laterally, reworking sediments and transporting it downstream. We then transition into a zone dominated by transport, lateral migration, and now some deposition. The river is trying to move more sediment through the system while also reworking much of the alluvium that it flows through. And finally, we move into a de depositional region, or primarily depositional, with some transport out of the system. Think of the lower Mississippi River of the United States, or its delta, or the same thing with the Nile in Egypt. Dominant transport mechanisms reflect these distinct reaches well, which also reflects the grain size that is typical of each reach. The headwater regions are dominated by boulder-sized grain sizes with roughly somewhere over 256 millimeters, uh, with bed load as the dominant method of transport. As sediment's broken down, we move into the gravel class of grain sizes as these boulders and rocks are constantly turned and uh, fractured and broken in the flow. And uh, we also see some suspension expected as well, where some of the smaller particles that have been shed from these uh, larger boulders and gravels are 
suspended in the flow. Moving downstream, we move into sand-dominated reaches of the river with some finer grain sediment expected as well. Uh, discharge is ever increasing downstream in these idealized systems, so we can expect the lateral gravel or the, expect the gravels have been chemically and physically weathered and broken down into smaller particles. Finally, we move into the reach where dissolved load uh, or those in solution or suspended loads are dominant. These reaches are dominated by high silt and clay loads, but sands and gravels can still be found. Pardon me. So now we can see uh, these trends relate to one another moving downstream. However, these are just two dimensional factors, uh, but they're not the only thing that change. So next we will look at the cross-sectional profile of a river, also characteristically changing downstream. Uh, in the headwaters, we'll typically see what we call a V-shaped valley, uh, very deep relative to its width, uh, taller banks, in another video, we dive into some of the typical ratios used to describe fluvial systems, so we won't dive into these too much here. Uh, but typically, the stream is confined to its channel, and it doesn't move around too much on these top reaches. In the next reach, the, valley, uh, the river valley is expanding, and the floodplain starts to develop and widen. The valley is still rather narrow, but it's expanding and laterally migrating and becoming more active, uh, not just incising, but moving laterally. Moving to the third panel, the valley has widened uh, substantially with the floodplain becoming wider than the valley walls. And finally, near the mouth of the floodplain, uh, or mouth of the river, the floodplain is substantially wider. So here we can see uh, a much wider width ratio regarding its depth. We can see that relative to the valley walls, the uh, valley floor is much wider. Uh, and typically we would think of these kind of like our very low reaches of a river. And here we can see what those look like in picture form. Uh, the first image comes from a stream in the Grand Tetons in the United States. Uh, we can see just how turbulent and choppy the water is here flowing through uh, some large boulders that we can see off to the right. The next image is from the banks of the Little Missouri River in North Dakota in the United States. Uh, we can see plenty of gravels uh, deposited on a point bar in front of us, uh, making up also the channel banks and bed. The uh, taller walls in the valley uh, also kind of give away that this is a little bit higher up in the stream. The next image comes from the St. Mary's River in Indiana uh, in the United States. And we can see a bit of a wider channel with almost a cloudy appearance, suggesting that there's some suspension and dissolved loads present in flow. And finally, on the right, we can see the Mississippi River in New Orleans, Louisiana in the United States. Um, different and contrasting to the uh, St. Mary's River, we can see just how wide and flat uh, the land around us appears as the river has been reworking this for thousands of years. We also see the barges as reference for just how large uh, this floodplain area is. So to recap, we talked about how the long profile and slope of a river can suggest dominant processes in a river. We know that slope tends to decrease downstream while channels widen. We move from erosional to depositional systems. Sediments tend to fine or decrease in size. And we shift from bed load to suspended and dissolved loads. So if you're interested in learning more about longitudinal profiles and how we use them to understand the evolution of a river, uh, I would suggest this recent paper by Boris Gayetan and others. I've provided a link to this paper and all others referenced in this lecture in the description below the video. So I hope you enjoyed the video and stay tuned for more.